same techniques like CMB. So I'm showing you power spectra in sort of five bands with Hubble, the cattle's feed, compared to uh, power spectra down here from Iraq with Spitzer and the power spectra up here from what's called Cyber. That's a sounding rocket experiment that we're doing separately. Um, but let me jump to a sort of summary on this. So we have now, instead of just having Iraq fluctuations, that used to be the case, and we heard about those from John Gabriel, from the work that Kashlinsky did. So now we have, you know, a multi-wavelength coverage in fluctuations from like 0.6 micron to 5 microns, and we can start to work on this, try to produce models, and the models the way we, at least we described in this paper, the models do involve two uh, key parts. So one is the, what I call IHL, or the intra-halo light. So, um, okay, my um, slides are not switching. All right, maybe this thing ran out of battery. Uh, Somebody, uh, I need somebody to replace this uh, remote control thing. Nobody's here. And I don't have a keyboard here to uh, switch the slides, unfortunately. There's a keyboard behind the screen. Oh, I had to get the guy. OK. All right. So uh, no, there's nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> they went to get lunch. Um, uh, now what do I do? <laughs> Sorry? OK. Uh, this, this stopped working. Please. Okay. Thank you. I don't know. Sorry. It's okay. I mean, I can't wait. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, I was talking about this slide explaining we have multi-wavelength measurements, and I said we have two components in this modeling, at least the way we explain these fluctuations. So IHL is the idea, this is the intra-halo light component. That's usually, uh, so this is a Switzer image of one of the galaxies, I think. Uh, you see the standard stellar disk, and these are the things that would usually be detected as galaxies and masked out. But usually, if you look at galaxies, you see this extended component or this diffuse light due to galaxy mergers and tidal strippings and things like that. And when you mass sources in images like this, it might be that we are not actually removing that extended component. We actually tested it out by moving this uh, what we call the mass radius to see how the fluctuations change. In any case, this seems to be the dominant signal in these fluctuations, this intra-halo light. And we can actually model that. Out, model that. So here is the intra-halo light fraction relative to the light in the galactic disk versus halo mass. So at very large mass scales, this is called intra-cluster light. That's the diffuse light or the diffuse emission at the centers of galaxy clusters. And these things can be seen individually for an individual cluster. Whereas down here at the mass scales of like Milky Way or below dwarf galaxies, kind of hard to see the individual intrahalo light. So you have to make a statistical measurement. But through statistics that we have measured, we can actually work out the expected intrahalo light fraction. That's this barred region. And in blue is the sort of the theory model that was run in an n-body simulation that involves mergers and tidal stripping to predict what this should be. So that's 
that's one signal. But then we have a fainter signal down here, which is actually this high redshift signal. So it actually has a, a sort of a Lyman break dropout feature that picks up at what redshift do we get this signal coming in. And it turned out, at least in the bands we were working with in the candles data, we can actually break it up into two broad redshift ranges, somewhere from about redshift of 6.5 to about 11. And this is really the dropout in the sort of the J band of Widefield Camera 3 coming at like redshift of 11. So, so then, given the level of the fluctuations, we can work it out. What is the total UV luminosity density? And that's what's plotted in these boxes at the 68 and 95% confidence level. And you can compare that to these measurements from people like Richard Bowens and the whole crowd that's doing these direct LBG counts, extrapolating those luminosity functions, and then working out what the UV luminosity has to be. And they plot those measurements down here. So we seem to see slightly higher UV luminosity density in fluctuations. But these are, you know, have very large error bars. So you have to take it what it is. And this is only done in the two good south fields. Those are the only two fields where we can do it. There's probably a huge amount of cosmic variance and things like that. That's not accounted in here. And in going forward, you know, there will be more data set, probably not with uh, Hubble, but with things like Euclid and W first, where we can actually work out very well what this has to be. So let me quickly jump to uh, Sphere X. So Sphere X is a, a small uh, satellite. Um, it's about 20 centimeters in aperture. And this is what's called the uh, small explorer in the NASA programs of various classes. So it's even smaller than a uh, you know, M class and things like that that ESA does. Uh, so if it's, uh, the, here's the Sphere X science team. But what I should say is, so this was, we competed in December 2014. We got selected by NASA for what's called the phase A which is sort of really um, preparation for the thing. We are not in the construction phase yet. And we did a phase A study for a one year to NASA show that, demonstrate that we can actually carry forward with this mission on schedule and to the cost that we said we're going to be able to do this and reach all our science requirements. So we submitted a phase A report uh, just recently. It's a huge, thick thing, uh, many, many pages of documentation. Uh, we have a review coming up. The NASA will send a review panel to review us in November, and there might be a down selection in December. And if we do get down selected, we'll go to phase B, which is really where the construction happens, and there will be a phase C and things like that. But eventually, we'll get to November 2020 or December 2020, where we will launch happen. So the launch of this will be parallel to Euclid at some level, uh, the way it is set up. Uh, so. Sphere X will cover from like 0.75 to 4 microns at an R of 40, and from 4.1 to 4.8 micron at R of 150. This essentially means we will have something like 98 bands, narrow bands, from 0.75 micron to 4.8 micron over the whole sky. And I'll show you um, the way we do it. Let's see. Um, so it's, uh, it's not using a grism. So the standard way Euclid and WFETS will do spectroscopy is with a the grism. There's no dispersion element. We are using what we call linear variable filters. So our CCDs, or on top of CCDs, we have filters that, that vary in wavelength. So usually standard astronomy, when people observatories, instruments, you put filters, it'll be the same wavelength. There's no reason why you can actually design a filter where the wavelength is varying across say, in one direction, which is what we are doing here. And then to take a, a spectrum on the sky at a given point, you actually have to shift your telescope. Right? So, so we can do that. So that, that added an extra penalty, which is like we have to spend our time surveying or mapping. But, but here we have a scanning or a surveying telescope. So the, the observations to get the full spectrum is built into a scan strategy or the stepping strategy to cover the whole sky. And these LVFs are not new. They've been flown in space before. So uh, New Horizons had an instrument, um, Lisa, that actually took a, a spectrum around 1.6 to 2.6 micron to see like methane absorption and make a map of Pluto in methane. And this was done with the LVF as the New Horizons flew through or had the flyby uh, next to Pluto. 
Okay, so uh, here's the band. Uh, let me back here. Um, so our, our all sky point source sensitivity is like eight and a half AB, roughly around five sigma. So let me jump here. So this is the uh, sky pattern or the survey pattern. So at, in each orbit, we do steppings to get the uh, spectrum. And then we come back and fill the rest. And we cover these uh, pre essentially NEP and SCP uh, regions uh, at least oh, in every orbit. So we have very deep field, roughly 200 square degree patches centered on NEP. And that's actually centered exactly on the Euclid center of NEP. Whereas in SCP, uh, the problem in SCP is SCP is sitting on LMC. But if you want to do cosmology, you don't want to be mapping LMC. So we, we're from the cosmology side of things. So, so we are seven degrees off of LMC, I think. And we think this should be the Euclid circle of 10 square degrees. But this is, well, this is the green is the Euclid circle of 10 square degrees. White is the 100 square degree circle of sphere X. Uh, this, in the deep field, we will get down to about 22 and a half. So by the way, each dot here is one of the sphere X bands. The big squares or rectangles are binning those bands to produce this broad band depth, the standard astronomical bands like you know, YJHK. Um, so down here is where we are in the all sky, but in deep fields, we'll be 30 times deeper in 200 square degrees, down to the level of like 22 and a half. Uh, what can you do with this data set? So uh, we're going to detect one and a half billion galaxies over the whole sky. Uh, we will get redshift with these 98 bands, better than 3% to something like 100 million galaxies, and better than 0.3% for like 10 million you know, we will see, you know, depending on whose models, we will see, like, you know, a large number of high redshift QSOs, um, many galaxy clusters. In fact, we claim to get redshifts for pretty much all of the Eros-Eta clusters um, using uh, spectra. Yeah, there's lots of science that can be with data set. So here's an example. How do we get the redshifts? So instead of having this broad band photometry, we have this narrow band photometry. And one of the things we will pick up is this 1.6 micron bump. And it turned out to be a good indicator of the redshift. Uh, and and we, we have the spectral resolution to be able to do that. Uh, so related to what I was talking about, CIB, this sphere X is designed very well to uh, map the cosmic light production or the cosmic infrared background. The same idea as I was saying, we can measure the fluctuations and look for the clustering. So the idea is to, to characterize very well things like the intrahalo light to the extent we can. Um, let me back. So then, uh, since we have narrow bands, essentially 98 bands, it's not broadband we can actually do this intensity mapping as a function of redshift. And we can do that at low redshift using like H alpha, and at high redshift like Lyman alpha. And then in between, we have you know, oxygen three, two, three lines coming up to, in our data set. So Lyman alpha is interesting because you know, it's tracing the reionization, the bubbles. There's a huge amount of physics involved in calculating the Lyman alpha intensity from first galaxies and its connection to the 21 centimeter background. And then uh, we will have sensitivity to see these Lyman alpha fluctuations maybe around redshift of five. But at high redshifts, you know, we don't actually have the signal to noise ratio to be able to do that. Um, so the, but the idea with sphere X is actually at least the deep fields, the 200 square degrees, is that we will create a Lyman alpha data set during reionization and make it public. So experiments from the 21 centimeter side, things like HERA or the SKLO, can actually use our data set to cross-correlate against the 21 centimeter fluctuations. And there, the cross-correlation can be measured. And the cross-correlation actually works in a way that wherever there's bright Lyman alpha galaxy, it will already produce UV photons. The hydrogen will be ionized. So the surrounding region will be essentially no 21 centimeter signal. So Lyman alpha and 21 centimeter at large scale will be anti-correlated or negatively correlated. And then you will see sort of, sort of a transition. And that transition is roughly what we call the bubble size. 
right? So we can statistically measure the bubble or reionization bubble size in several redshift bins, combining, say, a 21 centimeter data set with the Lyman Alpha data set produced by SphereX. So that's the product we're going to put out to the community if we go ahead with this instrument or the, um, the mission. Let me quickly summarize some W first things. I was asked to talk about W first science as part of this talk, so I'm going to quickly run through it. Uh, these are some of the slides produced by the W first science team that I um, got from them. So uh, W first, you know, is similar to Euclid, but not quite similar to Euclid, but has its unique things. Uh, you know, the telescope is larger, 2.4 meters. Uh, <coughs> And it has a, a capability to do exoplanet science, which is not part of the Euclid science program, uh, involving a chronograph and 10 to the minus 9 contrast imaging to detect uh, exosolar planets. And it has programs like microlensing and type 1A supernovae for cosmology. That is also not part of Euclid. But it does have the Euclid component involving weak lensing and BAOs and things like that. So uh, W first field of view is large compared to, say, the Hubble UDF or one of the fields of view of Wild Field Camera 3. So this allows you know, large mapping and, and you know, studies of nearby galaxies and things like that. Uh, here is a comparison of the depth versus a survey area. Uh, roughly, uh, the, in the sort of the widest area survey W first will be doing, like 2,000 square degrees, it's going to be reaching essentially the same depth as the deepest 40 square degrees with Euclid. Roughly the same bands, YJH, and a, and a long wavelength band. Uh, so there's many types of surveys thought about it. And, and, and W first will have a general general observing component, not like Euclid, 100% survey, so people can write their proposals, get time. So in these geo programs, people will also do large extragalactic surveys on areas that you know, they like for various reasons. But uh, the idea behind at least one in this highlighted use survey, which is a standard survey program that's about 1,800 to 2,000 square degrees, uh, compared to the number counts today, that may be about a few hundred galaxies at ratio of 6, 7, and maybe you know, a handful, 1 or 2, at ratio of 11. These are Lyman break dropouts. The idea is you will have you know, two to four orders of magnitude more detections. This, so you detect these things from the dropout signatures, but confirming and things like that will take su substantial amount of follow-up spectroscopy and all the other work. Um, so here again, the cartoon picture. A uh, wide field instrument, something like 280 million pixels with 18, uh, 40, I mean 18 H H4G detectors, and then a chronograph that has a contrast of 10 to the minus 9 or better. Um, so it's, if uh, W first is in what's called phase A, right now it'll move to, uh, if it follows, it passes certain reviews coming up next year, it'll move to uh, phase B, and it has an eight tier development time scale and launch is expected to be somewhere around 2025. So WFIRST will essentially launch after roughly five years of surveying with Euclid. So the Euclid data set will also add to the WFIRST sciences going on. So the last thing I have is uh, this infrared surveyor, which is the question, what do you do after JWST? So I know we have a talk on JWST. Uh, after my talk, but uh, what do you actually do? At JWST will have operations for about maybe 10 years after 2018 launch, but in 2030, we, you know, we are not going to have an infrared telescope out there. What are you going to do? So NASA had this question. So, so it's generally classified as infrared surveyor because we don't actually have a name to this quack yet. Um, so it's, it's in this planning stages right now where NASA is doing all these studies, and we are doing a study related to the infrared survey. So, uh, a study team was put together, so I'm chairing this with uh, Margaret Meisner, and it involves uh, representatives from NASA, also representatives from pretty much main uh, European space agencies, and from Canada and Japan. Um, so I lost the names. Uh, our study is based at one of the NASA centers in our case at Gallard, um, and here's the uh, primary study team from US, 
to uh, work out what we're going to do. So what's happening right now as part of the studies team, we set up uh, various working groups. So we have five science working groups. And each one of these working groups worked for the last four or five months. And they came up with something like 32 proposals uh, that are going to drive the technical requirements of the telescope and the instruments. It's going to basically come down to determining what should be the aperture size, what kind of wavelength coverage, what are the instruments we need to take the step from JWST to the next generation or in 2030, what kind of science we want to do and what do we need to do that. Uh, and then we have another working group separately that's studying the technical requirements and technical development of such a telescope. Um, so we are thinking about bridging the gap between JWST and ALMA. ALMA is long wavelength interferometer. JWST will go to about 30 microns. But you know, between that and the fine fret, there's a huge number of fine fret lines. Spectroscopy is one of the drivers for a mission like this. There's, uh, these lines carry lots of information about the interstellar medium of local universe, distant galaxies. Uh, in particular, you know, we can just like in the optical, people have used sort of line ratios, things like at nitrogen to the H alpha to separate starbursts and AG. And we can do similar things diagnostic. It's beyond that, there's so much information out there with these lines. So <coughs> it may be interesting to this group or this conference. Uh, in terms of sciences in, in the early universe, Cosmic Dawn, I'm gonna, we have identified a few things. I'm going to highlight this one, which is a way to see or measure or directly image primordial gas cooling during the epoch of reionization or even before reionization with molecular hydrogen lines. So the idea is primordial gas needs to have something to cool. Usually the standard cooling is atomic lines, but if you take the pristine gas, you don't have metals. So at least the theoretical understanding of this cooling is driven by molecular hydrogen. So you need to have molecular hydrogen to cool, and you expect molecular hydrogen to be present. Uh, so then all of that cooling uh, energy is radiated away in these vibrotational lines in the uh, molecular hydrogen. These show up in rest frame wavelengths like 12.3, 17, 28 microns. So it's this 28 and below. It's a huge series of lines that you can measure. So these have been seen with like Spitzer in low redshift galaxies, especially when the gas is shock heated and the gas is cooling. And uh, so the idea is, can we actually see that at like redshift of 15 with an with infrared space telescope? And what does it require to be able to directly image, say, these cooling sites? This is actually from a simulation that's highlighting where the molecular hydrogen is cooling. Can we actually directly see that? And can we connect that? to like, you know, galaxy counts and statistics of galaxies we will get with JWST. So here's an example of one of the ideas out there. There are other ideas out there. We're working through it. So, so as I said, the parameters are to be determined, but let's just call it a long wavelength space telescope that will cover from something like 10 microns to all the way like 500 microns, bridging the gap between uh, even having wavelength coverage over some of the ALMA bands. So the idea will be you need to have ridiculous some sensitivity, and the sensitivity is essentially driven by the idea that we want to be able to see the primordial gas collapse into dark matter halos very early in the universe, we, during and before even reionization. Uh, it will have roughly a thousand times sensitivity. So here is roughly some ideas out there. So this could be somewhere like a 10-meter telescope, maybe. And the question is, do we go down to 10 microns or 20? But here is the sensitivity of JWST. And here is the sensitivity of Herschel. Uh, so this is like roughly four orders of magnitude improvement, and maybe about a two orders of magnitude, one or two orders of magnitude improvement over JWST at the shortest bands. Uh, there's a huge num amount of technology ha that has to be developed for this. So one of the requirements will be JWST is not cold telescope, or the mirror is not cooled down. But to drive this sensitivity down to this level, uh, that requires this telescope will be cooled mechanically down to operating temperatures like 4.5 Kelvin. So how can you, you know, uh, the technology requirement or the technology driver to cool in the telescope is significant, so that has to be developed, but people are working on it. Uh, you know, large detector areas and things like that. And another thing that we probably will carry is a coronagraph to do uh, exoplanet science. 
And uh, so I'm, this is actually my last slide. This is just a quick movie cartoon of what one of these things might look like. Uh, this actually came from IPAC, that George Hill, who had a presentation at the SPY meeting. Uh, We have time for a few questions. I'll ask one. Uh, when would be the launch date for a long wavelength space telescope? Uh, yeah, so this will go into the 2020 decade, and the way the study is set up, at least uh, NASA has sort of a requirement or understanding. Whatever we come up with uh, will we'll be technologically ready for, to begin what's called phase A in 2025. So if it has like an eight-year development, roughly, which is the way things are working right now, things like W first, uh, you know, you're th thinking about 2033 type level of launch. Eight-year eight development? Yeah. Wow. W first is an eight-year development before it's launching. You can't start before W first goes. No. Yeah. 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 So yeah, W first launch will be 2025. We cannot start before that. Yeah. yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, we'll say thank you to you. <laughs>